Welcome to another episode of Financially Irresponsible with Rakim Sabri. I'm super excited to welcome you guys back. We are almost done with this season. And so I wanted to end this season with a bang. I know in the last episode I had a guest and I have another guest to close out the season, the next two episodes. So I want to introduce to you a great friend of mine and colleague in the mental health and money space, Asia Evans. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You're I'm very welcome. Thrilled to be here. So excited to chop it up and see where our conversation goes. Yes, I have been waiting for this moment for a very long time. We have been planning and um, not stressing, but definitely <laughs> reinforcing what those plans look like. And so I'm happy that you could have made it. Um, why don't we jump right in? So you are a financial therapist. Yes. We'll talk about what that means, but how did you get in? Like, talk about your journey through therapy mm -hmm. and then how did you cross over into financial therapy? So I, I decided I wanted to be a therapist. I was 12. Um, so I was very, very young. I just knew this is what I wanted to do, but the vision that I had for therapy is similar, but not really. At 12, I thought that I would be in some beautiful high rise in New York, in Manhattan, and talking to rich people about their problems. And to me, they had no problems. So it was like, just fake. Um, but I knew I liked being supportive and I pretty much decide, like, decided then that that's what I was going to do. So I went through, like, I remember counting the years before I got to high school, like, okay, four years of high school, four years of college, then I need to go to grad school. How long is that gonna be? So I am always giving major Virgo energy oh. <laughs> um, and definitely a planner. So I was doing that very early on. So went through that exact plan that I had stated for myself and um, got my master's in counseling psychology. And then after that, you have a lot of time to work, which is pretty much two years of working in the field, um, full time in the field. So that's what I did. Um, I worked at a day rehab. I worked um, as a fee for service therapist. Um, I was pretty much all over the place, got licensed and then continued to do more community based mental health work. So I have very much so been through the gamut of mental health, all the way from working with kids who um, Ha, are on the spectrum from three all the way to adults or um, seniors who have been living with severe mental illness um, in terms of like living in a state psychiatric center. So right. that was the last job I had before I became a full-time privately practicing therapist. And talk about, because you've been doing this for a while, talk yeah. about what you have noticed with adoption, particularly mm -hmm. in the black community around taking advantage of services like the services that you offer? Yeah. So, I mean, I think what people don't always realize is that we are trying to provide services to communities that very much so need it, but the services aren't always welcomed, <laughs> I think is the best way to put it. So when you are going into somebody's home, even though I am there for the family and for my client, whoever my client is, to support them and just kind of give a space, a safe space to have these conversations about their feelings, about what's going on for them, people know that I'm a worker. Right. Like I, I looked like a worker. I had my flats on. I was like kind of dressed up, but casual enough to be walking around in communities. And we, there's something about our bags. There's something <laughs> about like the way we have our bags and our notebooks, binders, whatever supportive materials and paperwork that we might need. There is something about that walking into somebody's home that they're like, mm, I know who you are. So even though you are there to be supportive because people have gone through such difficult times, it feels like you are almost the enemy yeah. and attempting to gain somebody's trust so that they feel safe talking to you to have a place to express their feelings when you are also considered kind of the enemy mm -hmm. is a really complex, um, 
position to be in and you also have to maintain your own professional boundaries yeah. but you're in somebody's home um, so it gets really complex when you are dealing with the feelings of a kid feelings of um, their adoptive family or their foster family and feelings that you might also be getting from the child from their biological family um, an interesting intersection that I didn't realize with adoption is that I totally forgot that my thesis in grad school was about um, children being adopted into different racial families. So if you were dealing with a black child who was um, adopted by a white family or an Asian child who was adopted by a white family, how did the families integrate their culture of the child and did they? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, and then later on, I married someone who was also adopted. So it's just been a really interesting um, position and yeah. timeline of my life and career that has gone into my personal life too. So it, it's just interesting to see. Yeah, as I listen to you kind of tell this story, I think about some of the, the coursework that I'm going through as a financial counselor, right? And there's yeah. this concept of transference, right? Which you yeah. you understand what that means. Yeah. But transference, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of transference is that basically your client is recognizing or remembering or reliving an experience, good or bad, through the interaction that they have with you. And then the, the, the process of counter-transference is you as the, the therapist or the counselor, you are now projecting your feelings onto them, whether they're good or bad, based off of previous interactions. And so when I think about going into a, a community that feels like you're the enemy, right? You're the bad guy. Yep. But going into that um, work, into that field, into that space with the level of compassion that you have through your lived experience, mm -hmm. how difficult it can be to not you know, experience that transference in engaging with, you know, trying to win yeah. their acceptance yeah. while also, like you said, maintaining those professional boundaries. Yeah. And so in a previous episode, I talked about the justified mistrust within communities of color, particularly black communities, as it relates to the financial services industry mm -hmm. in that, mm -hmm. okay, yes, there has been historical things that have occurred that, that make that mistrust justified. But what can we do as a community to then re-engage, right? To yep. get educated on the products, the services, um, the institutions as a whole, and, and leverage these resources into our wealth building practices. Yep. So yep. When, when you say what you say about going into these communities and what your experience has looked like, going into our communities, right? Mm -hmm. that, yeah. They're mostly we're, we're, yeah, we're part, of, we're part of the equation um, and feeling that resistance. I just kind of want to underscore like that parallel because the mistrust is often justified, but it's OK. Well, what steps can yeah. we take to kind of heal the divide and help people allow help them help us help them? Yep. Right. Yep. And uh, it's just fascinating how many of those intersecting points exist. Mm -hmm. So jumping back into your, your, your career, right? So you started, you're in therapy, you're, you're doing your private practice. <laughs> how did you become a financial therapist? What is a financial therapist first for people who don't know, but then how did you become a financial therapist and why financial therapy? Yeah, so I, financial therapist is somebody who is, to me, first let's back up. Financial therapy is a spectrum of humans, right? So there is one side where somebody might be coming from the professional, the financial professional side. The other side are um, people who may be coming from mental health and everything in between. Yep. So I myself identify as somebody who is specifically coming from the mental health industry. I am specific about feelings. Like I am here because I wanna get into the nitty gritty of your feelings, of the roots of those feelings, the behaviors. Um, I will dabble in um, numbers. I will bring up budgets with my clients. I will talk about their debt with my clients. I will talk about their income with my clients. Um, but as soon as we kind of start getting out of that scope, I'm like, this is beyond me. I will not be advising you on some of these things. That is not my lane, um, but I can refer you or introduce you to somebody who 
who loves that lane. Yep. So that's how I look at financial therapy and the way that I'm specifically doing it. Um, and then what was your second question? I'm sorry. How, um, how did you get into financial therapy? So you're coming from a mental health background. How did that transition occur? And then why did that transition occur? Yeah. So, um, in my mid twenties, I moved to New York city and that's where both of my parents are from. So I grew up going down and I call myself a little gremlin cause I was in Brownsville being a gremlin running around the streets. Um, that's where my dad's family is from. And my mom is from Harlem and also, um, Jamaica Queens. So we were running around there going to, you know, the penny cent candy stores and all of that. Like I lived a very New York city weekend life and then was raised in upstate New York. So, um, I always knew that I wanted to go back down and live in New York City. I just wasn't quite sure how, and I also needed to find a job. And when I did, I was so excited because to me, I was making more money than I had ever made before. I think my salary was closer to my mom's when I finally was able to move to New York City, and I thought I could just make it rain. I was ready. Um, so I did, <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> so, and that's what I did. I kept my car, I was going to brunch. I, I, the luxury of sending your laundry out, I was like, uh, I can afford to send my laundry out. And I did not all the time, but sometimes as a little treat to myself. And I was broke and I felt broke and I was not saving nearly as much money as I thought I should be. I didn't, when I looked at what my finances were at, I was like, why does this feel like this? And and why does it feel like everybody else is just okay? Like nobody's talking about this. Nobody is talking about their feelings. I found that my self-esteem was slipping um, in terms of like feeling like I needed to show up a certain way. Like I needed to be able to put my card down at the group dinner. I needed to be able to buy the round of drinks for people here and there. Um, and I was like, why can everybody else do this? And I can't, and it felt bad to me. So I just kind of sat on in those feelings and internalized them until um, my cousin, Tim, I saw him at Easter dinner in Brooklyn and he was like, well, Asia, like, have you looked into personal finance? Have you looked into just kind of learning more and financial education in general? I was like, no, oh, no. <laughs> so that was the beginning of my process and I, went ham and I could not stop consuming information about personal finance. And back then it was not readily available. Um, I mean, I'm dating myself, but I don't even think Instagram was happening at that time really, or it was very, very young and it definitely was only pictures. <laughs> um, so it was a lot of blogs that I was reading and just consuming information and books. And then that's when I was like, you know what? Now that I have this information, whenever my clients would bring up money, I'd be like, oh, let's talk about it. Tell me more. Like, let's get to the nitty gritty. Let's talk about your feelings. So to me, I kind of was doing financial therapy then. I just didn't know it. I didn't have a name for it. So um, about three years ago is when I found the Financial Therapy Association. That's when I found the Center for um, Financial Social Work. And that's when I also found trauma of money. And I decided that this was it. And I was really interested in this married two of my passions. So before that, I was like, do I need to get a, a CFP? Do I need to be a certified financial planner? Is that what I'm trying to do? Um, I didn't know how to incorporate the money aspect into therapy. So when I found them, it was this light bulb and this explosion of passion. And now I'm like, I get to talk about people's emotions and feelings that I feel very comfortable diving into and then talk about how their money's impacting it. So, yeah, yeah. great story. I, um, what I love about the, us finding each other mm -hmm. and we found each other at the financial therapy associations conference. So shout out to the financial therapy association is that our paths were quite literally the opposite, right? You came from a very strictly mental health background and found your way into money. I came from a very strictly financial background and yep. found my way into mental health. And as you're telling your story, like I'm reliving my story, right? Mm -hmm. I'm talking about money, but remembering, I worked in the banking industry for 10 years. I'm talking about money and I'm remembering what it felt like to be poor, mm -hmm. right? I'm remembering what those circumstances created for me or rather robbed me of yeah. in terms of experiences. 
by interacting with my clients. Yep. And so I'm interacting with clients who are on the wealth spectrum, right? They're people who have significant wealth yes. and they're treated a certain way. Yep. And then yep. there are people who have no wealth yep. and they're treated the opposite way. They're yes. treated almost kind of like they're diseased. And then you, you're in this role when, where you can educate, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can take the time to talk to people about, okay, I see your entire life right here in this mm -hmm. statement and this yep. is where you're spending your money and maybe you need to learn these behaviors or yes. you don't understand yes. how to use a credit card or what a credit card even is yep. but like i understand the background in that and so i started to talk about money through the lens of my experience yep. and the education on the job right and it just kind of married those two things and so i started really focusing on financial trauma mm -hmm. And calling it that, <clears throat> excuse me, thinking that I came up with the term, yep. not realizing that people have done work for years and years and years on mm -hmm. this. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, it's so interesting that um, we come from these very different backgrounds, but we found our ourselves in yep. the same like spot, yep. helping people reconcile what are their feelings and what are their behaviors and habits around money. Exactly. That's it. Um, I also really like how you talked about what does being a financial therapist mean to you mm -hmm. right because there is so much confusion out there around who can call themselves what um what designation applies what designation should i get right you talked about yep. do i need a cfp yep. and i've been like so opposed to going to get the cfp mm -hmm. for so many years and now that i've gotten to where i've arrived in my journey i'm starting to maybe reconsider mm -hmm. it and i'm like I could have got this thing, you know, I could have got this thing years ago, <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. you know, you have to go through what you have to go through to get exactly. to the point where you realize, like, how is this thing, this resource, this information, this tool going to benefit me in the way that I want to approach these topics? Exactly. And um, it's just, it is really fascinating that the field of financial therapy is starting to get the recognition and the attention that it is. Yep. Because so much, and I've talked about this so many times on the show, so much of the way that we approach money is just pure arithmetic, right? Yep. It's just yep. one plus one equals two. Yep. You should budget, you should save, you should invest, yep. but doesn't take into account lived experiences and culture, the division between what are our goals and what are our values. Right. Um, and, and, and education, right? Just yep. know how, right? There, there are people who want to make better financial decisions. There are people who even know what to do. Yep but they feel kind of trapped in the cycle of, and so what are your, what are your thoughts or your, your advice for anybody who feels kind of trapped in their circumstances, mm -hmm. but maybe feels like they have a little bit of the education to take action. It sounds like really that was your experience, right? Yeah, yeah. You knew that you didn't feel good, but you were making financial decisions that kind of contradicted or, or perpetuated those feelings. 100%. I, um, was just spending all my money. There's no other way to put it. I really was. <laughs> I was shopping all the time and doing all the things. And I want to be very clear with people and say that you can still spend your money. Please spend your money. Please enjoy your money, but make sure you can afford it. Um, that's the difference. I couldn't afford to live the way I was living, um, but I wanted to. <laughs> so what I tell people is like, first, like, let's think about what, what do you want? Like, what do you, what are your priorities? What are your financial priorities? Is that you want to retire early? Do you want to retire your mom? Do you want to pay off your debt? Do you want to have a hundred thousand dollars saved? Don't do that in a regular savings account, but no. <laughs> um, but is whatever your goal is, right? Figure out what it is. Um, and then figure out what information you need to actually get there. I think a lot of times people, can come up with these lofty goals, which are amazing. I love goals. I'm all about like, let's manifest that. But um, they don't really know how they're going to execute and they get bogged down and feel bad about themselves because it feels too lofty. It feels too big. It feels overwhelming to them. But sometimes we need to break it down. And that sometimes means that you need the education to understand. So if you have those two pieces now, how do you break down those goals? Like, Am I saving tens of thousands of dollars in a month if I'm not making that much money? No, like, no, 
but what can we do? Does that mean you need to look at your spending plan or your budget differently? Um, just taking the small steps and celebrating your wins. People do not give themselves any kind of grace. People just expect that they, like, I know what a budget is, keep to the budget, I made a mistake, I'm messed up, I'm awful, I'm this, I'm that, shame, 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 terrible, and that does not motivate you to do anything differently. Right. That makes you feel awful, that makes you feel less worthy, that impacts your self-esteem, can lead to depression, can lead to anxiety, and now you're trying to battle your mental health and not have money is the recipe for disaster. It just, it just doesn't work, so. Yeah, and one of the things that um, that you do for me quite often is you, you say that, right? You remind me like, hey, celebrate this victory, celebrate yes. this win, you did this thing. Like, how are you feeling about that? And I think we often get caught up in what is the next thing. Yes. And you said something that I just, I wanna hone in on. We talked about the goals because we're in the era of vision boards and, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I deserve and I'm attracting, you know, the law of attraction and, and I believe in all of that. True. Same. But when we talk about what those goals are um, and how we can break down those goals, if we can break down those goals mm -hmm. in comparison to what is our like reality in this moment. Yes. Like that definition or rather the defining of this is what I make, this is what my goal is, how do I close the gap between the two is so yes. important. Like you can't just wish for it to happen. And there's so much out there in terms of content that suggests that you can, like you just have to believe in yourself. You just have to apply yourself. Like there are people who are working themselves to the bone, yeah. but it's not about necessarily how hard you work. It's about what is your goal tied into your value, tied into your reality, in being able to make that thing happen. Right. So I think that that's super important and I'm, I'm happy that you shared that. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna wrap up, but before we part, I want you to share with the audience where they can find you. Mm -hmm. And maybe one quick tip that either addresses mental health or money or both that the audience can mm -hmm. walk away with. Um, so you can find me at asiaevanscounseling.com or I'm on IG and TikTok at Asia E Therapy. And one tip, I mean, I can't stop with the give yourself grace. Yeah. So for real, please be nice to yourself. When you want to be mean to yourself, stop, just stop and say something nice to yourself. You can say that mean thing, but then back it up with something nice about yourself. Um, because we are awful to ourselves and it does not help anything at all ever so be nice <laughs> awesome well this has been another episode of financially irresponsible i'm so happy that asia was able to drop the gems that she was able to and share on um, her journey and we'll see you guys next time The Saybrook Fish House in Canton has been serving fresh seafood, chicken, and steak entrees for 34 years, offering three cozy dining room settings, a newly renovated pub with craft beer, wine by the glass, specialty cocktails, and a lighter fare menu. Open for lunch and dinner seven days a week. Reservations accepted for parties of 2 to 42, and gift certificates are also available. The Saybrook Fish House, nestled at the crossroads of Route 44, 202, and 179 in Canton. I'm your host, Kurt Barwis. Today, I have a very special guest, Dr. Andrew Lynn. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Veterans Corner. My name is Chuck Wooden. Decision for ourselves for this week if we want to be made well. Hi, welcome to the crack of dawn. It's Dawn Lombardi. I'm starting the painting. It's going to be the clips with some water. Love it. He took me on the sets of Lost in Space, Batman. Everybody has a story. What's yours? Until next time.